morning and welcome to Liberty Christian Fellowship. Thank you for joining us and to seek and worship God here today. December 15th is the Bill of Rights Day. The Bill of Rights was signed this day in 1787 and represents Christmas time for freedom. For centuries, God worked with Christian people in Western civilizations to give them the understanding of the freedoms he endowed upon man. When America's founders finally figured it out on July 4, 1776, they published the Declaration of Independence, faithfully stating that God, our Creator, endowed us with unalienable <coughs> rights. Referring to those rights God gives us through the Ten Commandments, Thomas Aquinas called these rights our nat natural Decalogue rights. Thus, there are Ten Commandments and there are Ten Bill of Rights. Each Bill of Rights is designed to compel people in government to treat we the people according to God's Ten Commandments. Today's message is on Romans 10 verses 5 through 9, entitled, Salvation is found only in Christ, who descended, died, resurrected, and rose. Let's turn our hearts now to prayer and ask God to meet us and renew us as we worship in song and in his word and in fellowship together. Lord, we lift your name. Your name is the highest among <coughs> all names. Jesus Christ, we give you all the praise and glory and thanks and honor. And we love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time and for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Today's message is titled, Salvation is Found 
only in Christ, who descended, died, resurrected, and rose. I'm going to tackle a piece of scripture today that I've never heard anybody exegete, but I looked it up and I looked it up and I looked it up and I think I got it. So, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We're going to stop there. Here, our message map for today is uh, those four verses. Our righteous actions cannot ascend us into heaven. Or another way to say that is, is that anything that we do cannot justify us in God's sight. Well, I take that back. There's only one thing we can do. That first step is to be born again, to receive Jesus Christ. But even that first step is the result of the Holy Spirit's work inside of us. We're going to see that today. All right. Romans 10, 7, we're going to see that Christ is the res resurrection and life who frees spirits from the abyss. The abyss or the abuso is both metaphorical and it's an actual physical place. Because we're going to read today uh, how we were in darkness before Christ came. The third thing we're going to look at is in Romans 10.8. Belief in Christ provides justification by faith. And then Romans 10.9. Christ alone came down, died, descended, and rose. I was trying to find a D word for rose, but I couldn't come up with one. And all of this for us means, praise God, Emmanuel has come. So let's start unpacking this. We can't ascend into heaven on our own ability to keep God's law. Remember, there's two ways to get into heaven. Don't sin. Well, there's three ways. No. Yeah, don't sin, which means you're going to keep the law. Or you receive Christ and you accept his sacrifice for our sins, which justifies us in God's sight. We all decided a long time ago we're going to take door B. So now... Romans 10, 6, but the righteousness that is by faith, that means God's divine persuasion that motivates us to have confidence in God's will. But the righteousness that is by faith does not say who will ascend or I will go up, I will rise, I will mount up into heaven. You can't get there on your own strength. Or because that is to bring Christ down. That's, that's sort of, that's not sort of. God says if you do that, if you think you can get there on your own strength, you're actually uh, degrading the work of my son. You're actually degrading the position that I've given my son. And I've given it to no one else. Christ has this, heaven, this position. He's seated and raised in the heavenlies. And, and if you say that you can get there yourself, you're putting Christ on par with somebody else or something else. Maybe even with yourself. Maybe you're on the throne of your life. Maybe not Christ is. Uh, maybe Christ is not. Now, I've given you three scriptures here. Ephesians 1.20, Ephesians 2.6, and Colossians 3.1. Are those in your notes? Yes. Okay. Now, Ephesians 1.20 says this. Uh, you got to kind of go to verse 19 to pick it up. But it says, God exerted his mighty power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. How many people could be seated in the seat next to God's right hand? How many people? How many seats are there? There's just one. Okay. Ephesians 2, 6, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, 1, Then you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, this righteousness is that of which God is the source and the author. It's a practical, divine righteousness that properly meets God's judicial approval. 
We want to be approved in God's sight? There's only one way. Receive the death that Christ paid on the cross for our sins. Now, what does that word practical mean? It means that it is concerned with the actual doing rather than with just theory and ideas. It's designed to succeed or be effective in real circumstances. It's suitable for a particular purpose. It's sensible and realistic in a situation to which a response to a problem is required. God's righteousness is good for all times. God's righteousness should function within us and through us in every circumstance and situation. So to paraphrase, if we want to live practically for Christ in this life, under God's, within God's judicial approval and righteousness, we will have to rely upon His righteousness that comes by faith. And we cannot rely upon how much or little we keep God's law. Relying upon our own abilities is like thinking we can do, it's like thinking one of two things. It's thinking that, number one, we can make it on our own. And if you think that, you're, God puts us in a realm of saying, who will ascend? And if you unpack that word ascend, it means I'm going to go up to heaven by, on my own steam and my own power. We can't go to heaven on judgment day and say, Lord, here I am, let me in, I'm the man. Or, in your case, I'm the ma'am. You know who said, I will ascend into heaven? Satan. Satan. In Isaiah 14, 13, Satan attempted to ascend and exalt himself above God. And in Isaiah 14, 13, God says of Satan, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I was talking with someone yesterday morning. They've been calling me for a few days. And, and uh, our conversation at one point went like this. Look, the more you say I, the less you're focused on Christ. And the more you're trying to be something or think you're something, the more you're not focused on Christ. What you should be saying is, I want to be what God wants me to be. Because we all have our own carnal ambition. Remember, God leads, your flesh drives, your, we can have these carnal ambitions that drive us, and I like to say Satan pushes. We used to, uh, when I used to do youth camp, we used to liken those three things to three different brands of speak sneakers, which more or less use those three things as their motto. <laughs> But I'm not going to do that here. There's a lot of Bible verses about ascending, and none of them are good. Deuteronomy 30.12 is one of them. We're going to read this later, so I'm not going to do this now. But Amos 9.2 is another example where God references somebody trying to ascend. Jeremiah 51.53, it's, like, it's, it's referenced to Babylon in Jeremiah 51.53. In Isaiah 65.17, God says, See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. Things that are remembered, um, the former things are not remembered. You won't even remember how, we're, how ambitious you were when we see Christ. He'll change us. We'll, we'll, we, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Let me move on. I love this next part. Christ is the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. He actually said this, though, to um, Martha and Mary when He was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Anyway, Romans 10.7 Who... We're not to say who will ascend nor who will descend. That, me, that word literally means who will come from the sky or a higher land, into the abyss, into an unfathomable depth, and especially Jewish conception of the home of the dead of the spirits. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. God says, you can't resurrect him. This is reminding me of certain rituals and ceremonies that certain churches engage in, where they literally think that they are bringing Christ down, transubstantiating him, and resurrecting him. 
King James says it this way, or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from the dead. God is warning us not to ascribe, imagine, or encroach. Do not ascribe to ourselves or another the divine position and attributes reserved for the incarnate Christ. I do not know the exact ritual that these people must go through, but I've been reading, I read up on it several months ago when uh, a scandal had broken out about uh, homosexuality in a church. And I, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the bishops and cardinals was saying, well, there's only very few people in the world who could transubstantiate, so you have to give them a pass on certain sins because they are special people. You think, you think you get a wrong doctrine and it, and it leads to very, very bad behavior. If, you know, you've heard this before, right? If you take a, a journey that's 100 miles and you get a little bit off course and you stay off course, by the time you've gone 100 miles, you're, 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 you could be 10, 20 miles from where you really should have, where you, where you should have been. Um, don't imagine that one can come from the realm of the dead over which God alone has authority. It's always amazing to me that people think they can pray, they can pray the dead out of whatever. It's a point unto man to die once and then comes a judgment. We are not God. We cannot, we do not have authority over that which God and his son have authority. Do not ascribe, do not imagine, and do not encroach upon the resurrection by insinuating anyone or anything else has the power to affect life after death or death after death. Did you get that? There is life after death for the believer, but there is death after death for those who don't believe. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You know, Romans 6, 10, 6 through 7 is actually... Um, a commentary or a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 20. I'm going to read this. For this is the commandment that I command you today, is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. See, we saw that in Romans. Don't go someplace looking for it. It's going to be within you. God's going to place it within us. As Mary was incarnated with Christ, so Christ gets incarnated in us. Or as Christ was incarnated in Mary, so too does Christ get incarnated in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us? I'm sorry, yes, heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea, some translations might say the deep, uh, see for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. In a sense, we're kind of without excuse for not doing it. I'm working on a concept that we're going we're gonna to work into one of these messages, but we don't do what God wants us to do because we don't trust Him. If you, strength of relationship equates to intensity of change. The better you know Him, the more you will trust Him. So when we have challenges trusting Him, it's because we don't know Him. And knowing Him is a, is a matter of growth. It takes time. Because the only way to really know God is through His Word. And it takes time to learn His Word enough so that you know Him well enough to trust Him often enough. Verse 14, But the Word is very near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so that you can do it. Verse 15, See, I have set before you today life and death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I command you today by loving the Lord, your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord, your God, will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve him, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish 
You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, a blessing and curse. It's always an if-then proposition. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them. That's a metaphor for how God wants us to walk in this earth. It's a metaphor for how we take territory for God right here on this planet. Not in some col colonial um, conquering sense, but in the sense that more and more hearts yield to Christ. Wouldn't it be cool if all the people around us came to Christ and they got plaques in their house that said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sometimes I get in discussions with other pastors about evangelism. And they say that there's no sense in evangelizing. It's all over. We have lost. The, the, the new world order is here. The book of Revelation is here. Which it's not. We're just seeing the setup. But God always gives us if-then propositions. And they'll say things like, well, uh, I'll try to tell them about how America was founded on the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights. And they'll say, well, we're not under the law. Pastors are telling me this. And I'm like, I used, to, I used to hear you guys say that, and I used to scratch my head trying to figure it all out, but I figured it out. We're not under the ceremonial law. But what we are under is the moral law. And growth in Christ is growing in sensitivity to, to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, who makes us more and more, who conforms our lives more and more to the moral law. We have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. I was on a trip recently, and unbeknownst to me, there was a pastor and a worship leader in the group. Not, they don't go to the same church. But we went, to, went out one night together, and the pastor told me, he said, I've been teaching the Bible in a particular way, and I've gone online, and we've looked at some of your messages. And he says, You're, we're, 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 I think I got a Facebook friend request from his wife last night. I went and searched to see what the, the names of the people were like, peaceable and grace. I said, okay, these are Christian people. <laughs> so I responded to that friend request. If God is going to rescue our world, He's going to rescue our world through the application of His Word to everything. God has not separated Himself from anything. And if people around the world are going to be free to live as God wants us to live, we have to apply His Word to everything. All right, Romans 10.8. Christ, belief in Christ provides justification by faith. But what does it say? The word, the word of faith that we proclaim, is near. Look at that. That word means it's close in place and in time. God transcends place and he transcends time. Right? God is pre-Genesis, he's post-Revelation. God is everywhere, always present. At the point of time when Christ was on the cross... God reached into Genesis, he reached forward into Revelation, he swept all the sins from all time on Christ. God is near in place and in time. Psalms tell us that all the time. I could go down to the depths, you're there. How can I, I can go to the highest mountain and he's there. Because if you confess, that means if you agree publicly, declare in full agreement and in alignment to, adore, to endorse him with your mouth, that word means as a spoken testimony that Jesus is Lord. Faith comes by hearing, and if we if, if we don't if we don't speak it, I had a very cool conversation with a person uh, while I was waiting for Don at rehearsal, 
And he started reading Bible verses and he was mocking them. I mean, he was really mocking them. And I got really upset. And I said, I know the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. And the Holy Spirit just said, just wait, just wait. And he touched into a Bible verse. I thought, okay, Lord, this is where we can start. And I said to him, go back and read Genesis 1, 1 through 3. He goes, what am I looking for? I said, well, you got to read it without fooling around. And he did. And there's God. In the beginning there was God, and there's the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. I said, now go read John 1, 1 through 3. And he read John 1, 1 through 3. And he said, how could this happen? There was another Christian who had come down and sat across from me, a, a table away, and I saw his head down. I knew he was praying for that man. And we watched his demeanor change. And then he said, well, where did John the Baptist come from? And I said, well, now we're going to have to go over to Luke. <laughs> and then he went into a tirade about a church that he was raised in. Now we never got answers. And he goes, and you Christians? I said, no. You, you get answers from the Bible. If those people weren't pointing you towards the Bible, they were not pointing you towards the answer. You ought to be upset. You did get ripped off. But you need to get forgiveness and you need to get peace in your heart. The peace that passes understanding. Go home. Read those scriptures. Just ask God. Say, Lord, if you're truly there, reveal yourself to me. And if you, if you make yourself out to be a sheep, the good shepherd will speak to you. All right. His word never returns void. His word is in your mouth. Isaiah 55, 11, when I learned that Bible verse, I mean, I read it years ago, but it started becoming more and more real to me. And so I always try to get people to read God's word. Or I speak scripture to them. And you'll hear people who call themselves Christians, who are subtle agents of Satan. You hear them on Fox News even. And they'll say things like, well, we don't, when we're talking about speaking about these things in a rational way, we don't want anybody quoting Bible, the Bible verses. Because those are day stoppers. You can't really talk about them. Just because people call themselves Christians, let's not give them a pass anymore. They are ruining everything. They are suppressing the one act, avenue of truth on this planet. And they have been doing it subtly. And now they're doing it not so suddenly. The only hope for the lost people in this world is that for, for them to bump into some Christian who loves God, who honors His Word, and who will deliver it. All right. Believe in your heart. Oh, I'm sorry. We skipped the word Lord. Jesus is Lord. Is He? Look at this term. Those are frightening words when you're young, aren't you? Aren't they? He exercises absolute ownership rights of our lives or over our lives. Do you choke on those words? Have you put your toes? on the cliff of the heel of the, of the cliff of faith and say, God, I'm going to let my heels hang over that cliff and I'm going to abandon my life to your word. We can ask God to make us the kind of people in whom he can exercise absolute authority and rights over our lives. All right. And believe in your heart. Look at the word heart. It's the effective center of our being and the capacity of moral preferences and volitional desire or choice. Did I put that in there twice? I just give it to you once. Uh, okay, you got to. Oh, I, I repeated it. There must be a word in there I was trying to get to. Let's see. Oh, desire producer. There it is. 
if he's the Lord, he transforms this and our desires get produced by him. I know that seems kind of counterintuitive to the humanistic world in which we live, in the humanistic way we are taught to live, to be human-centered. But the only way to find your life is to lose it to this. Very counterintuitive. If you believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be healed, preserved, rescued from the penalty and power of sin and from the destruction that sin causes and will be brought into divine safety. This is why it is such good, 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 good news that Jesus Christ came. Amazingly good news. Uh, you don't have this script. You, you don't have the, You have these fill-ins in your notes. Next. What's before that? No, that one's fine. Okay. You get in the middle there. Nineteen is missing. See, it goes from eighteen to twenty. Oh. Oh well, the yeah, yeah, but you have a you have a fill-in at nineteen. Is that where prison is? All right, look at 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Christ alone came down, he died, he descended, and he rose. This is why God doesn't want us believing that, this, that these things can happen some other way. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ suffered once. This is cool. Look at that word. It means one time of perpetual validity so that it need not be repeated. Again. Isn't that cool? If you get in touch with that, you get in touch with forgiveness, you get in touch with God's acceptance. If we relate to more to how God loves and forgives us than, than how we want to do our thing or how we feel guilty about our thing, God will get more mileage out of our life. I used to pray when I, was, when I first read the, uh, the Greatest Commandment. I used to pray, Lord, I want, you, I want you to put love in your heart. I'm sorry. I want you to put your love in my heart so I love you more than. And you can name the sin. Or the activity I was engaged in. And one by one, the love of God overrode those things, and I began to, the Lord began to clean up my life. That He, all right, He died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And if we get in touch with that one too. It'll lead us towards righteousness. He's already, he's already died for us. We should be able to abandon ourselves to him. All right. That he, Christ, might bring us to God. That means to render us acceptable to God, where we are assured of his grace. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I die daily, said Paul. In which he went and proclaimed or preached the gospel as the authoritative binding word of God, bringing eternal accountability to all who hear it. I had a guy once say to me, I wouldn't be going to hell if I never heard you preach the gospel to me. I said, no, 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 you were going to hell anyway. <laughs> he goes, because you Christians, you say, you have to believe this. And if I don't believe it, then you say you're going to hell. Well, does that mean I would not be going to hell if I didn't, believe, if I didn't hear it? <laughs> well, you're still a sinner. You're still violating God's commands, whether you know it or not. His law is written on our hearts. No man, every man will be without excuse. We were doing an exercise last week, two weeks ago, and uh, one of the exercises was, um, uh, is a half-truth a lie? Sometimes you're analyzing legislation and you got to, you know, a change is coming that's going to affect the people that are working for you. And you don't want to put out the information too soon because you, it's half-baked. You don't know how it's all going to play out yet. The regulation is pending. When do you start telling people? Well, the word starts spreading throughout the organization that something is happening. It might not be good. And do you start telling, do you tell a half-truth? And is a half-truth a lie? I wish I was in Chris's Bible study when they were discussing Rahab. Very real issues for me. <laughs> so, one of the deciding factors of that discussion was when I told the class, well, the Bible says every man's a liar. Some people said, well, why would it say that? And other people piped in because every man's a liar. <laughs> 
And one guy kept saying, as this type of discussion kept coming up throughout the week, wait a minute, what are we supposed to do? And we all said, well, you'll have to use your ingenuity. You'll have to rely upon whatever you rely upon to make your decision making. For me, it would be the power of the Holy Spirit. But you, at that point, you'll have to determine, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? What I really would like you to do, though, is understand that sometimes your boss will say, you can't tell people this. That's where it becomes challenging with you as a manager. Just because your boss may be a coward doesn't mean that you have to be. Once we know what's going to happen, I tell stories in my book about being honest with people well in advance and watching them help us solve our problems as opposed to the last minute springing a horrible change on them. Just be, we tend not to tell people information because we're anticipating a negative response. I'm the same way. We tend not to tell people about Jesus because we're anticipating a negative response. A few years ago, I was uh, working in the, the volunteering for the organization that runs this building. I was up in Saratoga, and I was writing a book, and I thought, this will be great. I'll volunteer to watch the, um, the I forget, the hospitality room. And the first night, I realized what a horrible mistake I made. <laughs> because while they're all watching, doing stuff, they're all down in the convention, I'm watching the hospitality room. The, you have to go someplace else to eat your meal. I can't go eat my meal. I can't go down to, the, to get my, my food until people occupy the hospitality room. I'm always missing my meal. The second day I went down, I'm coming up late from breakfast, and I'm bringing my breakfast to the hospitality room, and there's, uh, there's no place for me to sit. And I'm realizing this, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm really the odd man out here, aren't I? Finally, a, a place opened up and I sat down, and there was a man at that table. I don't know what had happened in the earlier morning session, but this man was crying out to, from, from, crying out to God from his heart. And I kept trying to talk with him. He was sitting one over from me, cross. And I kept trying to engage. And I'm looking at all these people. I'm like, this, and nobody got it. And I said, God, if you want this man to get saved, everybody's got to leave this table. And they got up and left. Another Christian came. Hey, Earl, can I sit here? Yes. And I'm trying. And she's interrupting. I said, God, you got to get her out of here. Oh, Earl, you don't mind. There's so-and-so over there. I'm not trying to be rude. Said, no, 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 you can go. <laughs> Third person starts walking towards the table. Hey, Earl, hey, how you doing? I said, God, if, 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 if this person's going to be helpful, if not, two steps away from the table. Oh, gee, there's somebody over there I really need to speak to. Do you mind? And as I explained the gospel to that man, he kept going over it. And he goes, let me get this right. Christ died for my sins. Yes. Do you believe? Yes, I believe that. And he goes, I said, well, would you like to receive him? He goes, let me get this right. Christ died for my sins. I really don't have to do anything to receive that. He goes, I've been a Catholic all my life, but I, I, I've been trying to figure this out. And he goes, who would not do that? I later found his boss. They were with the lighting crew. And uh, he goes, yeah, he came downstairs, he was all bubbly and something happened, and it's, so he's telling some black guy upstairs. And, and he goes, and, and he goes, he goes, but isn't the same guy? I said his response was, who wouldn't do that? And him and his crew said, yep, that's him, that's our guy. <laughs> that's how he talks. Have you ever led someone to Christ? Now, I'm not going and saying we got to go around and get like, oh, I got to make sure this guy prays or this person prays. At the, un, at the most unlikely times, there are souls and hearts crying out to God. And we're going to read later in verse 17 of chapter 10. They can only get there is some crazy Christian or some obnoxious Christian. I don't care how you, how you want to categorize it. 
God says in Deuteronomy, I'm laying out life and death. I'm laying out good and evil. There are real consequences for people. I've seen it happen so many times now. I'm going to Texas this tomorrow tonight to go. I'm going to teach a course I never taught before. I made it up as a, you know, I made it up. <laughs> I hope it's okay. <laughs> there are going to be people there that probably know more about that subject than me. But you know me, I'm not there to teach that course. I'm there to, I am there to provide a, a, a competent service to my employer, to my contractor. But I know why God has me do these things. And if I wasn't a halfway decent tent maker, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do this witnessing. A man told me last session, he goes, you know, in my country, what you just said is outlawed. And I said, and that's why God brought you here. But know this, if I was in your country, I'd be telling you this anyway. It's that important. All right. So, this is really cool. In this passage of Scripture is the only time I think this, this concept appears in Scripture. He was made alive in the Spirit in which he went... See, Christ was bodily resurrected, but before he was bodily resurrected, his spirit went down. Apparently, right, this is what the Word says. I'm not making this up. In which he went and proclaimed, preached the gospel as the authoritative binding word to the spirits in prison, those confined under a guardian. Now, if you read that, if you read, um, uh, read this, it tells you that these... Oh, here it is. They were, they were, um, these were, the, these were the, the souls that waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared. I don't think it's only them. It may be others. It may be all the souls before, between, uh, you know, in the beginning there was God, Genesis 1, 1, and the advent of Christ. Everybody got a chance. Those who are in prison, those can find under a guardian. A guarding. doesn't say guard, because it's not like some angels there guarding them. It says they're under a guarding. So I'm figuring God did something to confine them there. Because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Now, when Christ comes back, it'll be like the days of Noah, right? So this is us. While the ark was being prepared in which a few things that is eight persons were brought safely through the water. This, this is like a baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal. To, we're, God, remember when I told you about the, the, the seven or eight baptisms in scripture? The first one is that God baptizes us spiritually. He goes into the depths of our lives. He preaches to us while we're in prison and he, and, and he appeals. This means that he actually, uh, he, he meets us who have earnestly sought a kind conscience that is reconciled to God. Through the resurrection, bodily raised from the dead of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected. That means they're ranked under and they are submitted to him. This is really cool. Angels, authorities, and powers are all subjected to Christ. Isn't that awesome? It's amazing God that we serve. How else can we not be successful? How else can we not operate as an Elijah, taking on the prophets of Baal? All right, what does all this mean? How did God bring this all together? Let's look at Luke 1, 26 through 33. The angel Gabriel announces the virgin birth. You want to read this with me? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now let's freeze here for just a moment. <clears throat> she was greatly troubled and the angel said do not be afraid Mary we're about to impregnate you we're going to make you an unwed mother in a society that stones such people you are going to bear the brunt of this for the rest of your life. And your son is going to be scorned for it. What does it take to identify with Jesus Christ? Who many people, the powers that shouldn't be, the PTSBs I call them, who want to make him public enemy number one. Now let's read the next one. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angels answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary said, I'm so glad the Lord. I hope this is becoming real. What she actually did. What she said yes to. I hope this is coming real. When you're standing at your coffee counters tomorrow morning. I hope this is coming real when somebody at work, you just sense that, they're, that something is going on inside of them. You know, I've been reading all these things about evangelism. When, so, when somebody dies, people are open to evangelism. Because they're thinking about death. Mm -hmm. When a baby's born, people are actually thinking about evangelism, the miracle of life. When someone's going through a divorce, when, when someone's bad decisions have finally come home to roost. People's anniversaries. They said their vows before God. It's a key time for evangelism. What is the result of all this? Let's read one more slide and we'll be done for today. And this is Jesus Christ. If you go a couple of scriptures, it's right here, Galilee of the Gentiles. See, God never disintended for us to be left out. Let's read this together. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word darkness, it means to be ignorant of divine things, and also 
It's associated wickedness and result in misery. You're in misery, but you don't know why. You can't quite put your finger on it. You need an interpreter. You need someone who can interpret spiritual things. You need a Christian. You need a Bible reading Christian. The whole world needs Christians. I've heard many pastors say, well, the reason I'm a pastor is because all these issues are spiritual. And they over-spiritualize everything. And we never get down to it. Light is the manifestation of God's self-existent life, divine illumination to reveal and impart life through Christ. Do you believe that God would use you this way? Well, exercise some faith. Get that little twinge. I know we're going to second guess and think, well, I had too much peanut butter this afternoon. <laughs> I think it's better to do and stumble than not to do. There are times when people may yell at you for something that God is calling you to do and it doesn't feel good to be yelled at, but you know that you're doing what God wants you to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being an awesome God and Savior who loves us. Lord, we thank you for being an awesome God and Savior who loves other people. It's amazing what you do. It's amazing how you turn skeptics around. It's amazing how you are so good in that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, the ungodly, the righteous for the unrighteous. Stir us up, we pray. Move in our hearts. Transform our thoughts. Because certainly, Lord, this time of year, when we are celebrating the advent of your coming, people certainly are more open than at other times. Perhaps even more so now than Easter. But Easter is another huge opportunity, Lord God. Father, I want to pray for the people I've referenced in my message today. The man who is reading scripture with me on Thursday. Let your grace and mercy work in his heart, Father. Please, Lord, help him let down his defenses. Respond to your Holy Spirit's prompting to read the Gospel of John. Lord, I pray that you would be so faithful to him to burst forth from the pages of your word. Change his life, God. In Jesus' name we pray.
Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 